Racecraft by Barbara J. Fields and Karen Fields, Chapter 2. Individual Stories in America's Collective Past. To write a new chapter requires awareness of a past that all Americans share, whatever their ancestry. The wizardry of racecraft makes Jim Crow appear to have affected black Americans alone. It also makes slavery appear to have involved the South alone and to have vanished without repercussions when the Civil War blew it away in 1865. In the teaching of American history, perhaps the most difficult lesson to convey is that slavery once held the entire country in its grip. It was not just the business of enslaved black people, slaveholders, or the South. Slavery engaged an immense geography of connected activities that no Americans could escape, whoever they were and wherever they lived. What is more, slavery does not belong only to America's past, but is the heritage of all Americans alive today, including those of recent vintage. Slavery enthroned inequality both among free citizens and between slaves and owners, and in the manner of its ending, left inequality as a permanent bequest to America's future. The history writ large of most school books is better at linking events in the past than at discerning continuity between past and present. Stories about actual people in their lives and real worlds of the past dramatize that continuity. In our first appearance on a platform together at the 4th Southern Conference on Women's History at the College of Charleston in June 1997, we presented the script that follows to other teachers and published it here for the first time. The stories it recounts concern Americans in diverse historical circumstances who differ by ancestry, class, economic predicament, and national origin. The earliest story dates from 1862 and the most recent from 1991. Introduction. Good afternoon. This is going to be fun for us. It is the first time Professor Fields and I have shared the same platform, let alone attempted a duet. Our subject above and beyond what the title says is the connection between scholarly research and teaching. Even though this is the first time we have tried a duet, we have worked together for many years. We work in different disciplines, history and sociology, but we regularly exploit each other's scholarship. I footnote Professor Fields, Professor Fields footnotes me. We assign each other's writings to our classes and lecture on them. We have long talks over the phone about ideas and we read work in progress to each other. We also share a fascination with language and especially with ordinary turns of phrase that derail thought. What is more, we approach our work in similar ways. In particular, we both hold the philosophical view that means and ends should cohere in all human endeavor, a rule that applies to scholarly research in the social sciences, no matter what discipline, and I dare say more generally to research in any field. If the goal of research is to learn about the nature of our world, then research only fulfills itself in close connection with teaching. That is true even though some of the time, of course, we do research for ourselves and for the sheer solit solitary joy of it. Sometimes, too, we do it with our professional peers in mind, but often we do it while imagining that very special retelling we feel privileged to do as teachers of the young. We follow a profession that is not only honorable, but critical. Classically and now, teaching has a civilizational mission. It is the main source and resource of human continuity, hence of community. As this gathering consists mainly of people who are, in one way or another, teachers, we thought we would spend the brief time at our disposal discussing with you some stories and documents to which we often recur in our teaching and that turn on two themes that constantly engage anyone trying to understand the American past. These themes stand out most clearly, perhaps, if expressed in terms of two sets of apparent opposites, individual experience versus collective experience and separate histories versus joint histories. We will illustrate these points with the help of seven stories to which we have assigned personal names. John Boston, Rebecca Garvin, Aubrey Welch, Mrs. Samuel Burden, D 
downtown white people, William Faulkner and, and Toni Morrison. Racial Divide. With the contrast separate versus joint, we indicate a distinction that only sometimes makes sense between something called African American history and something called simply American history. We insist that what we call in our title America's collective past cannot be understood or taught without both, and furthermore, that neither can be understood separately from the other. In making those claims, however, we run up against certain common terms, turns of phrase, and metaphors. If teachers could censor terms for their baneful influence on education, we would go after racial divide. Its nearest semantic parallel is perhaps the continental divide, which refers to a physical separation that popular imagination used to visualize in terms of Boston back east and Dodge City out west. That metaphor of separation confuses thought and leads it in the wrong direction. Afro-Americans and Euro-Americans have always lived not separately, but in close quarters, as our stories will illustrate. Equally, and for the same reason, we would impose severe zoning restrictions on the range of the term segregation. For all its dividing black from white by law and custom, Jim Crow was a historically specific set of arrangements for living separate lives together. How that was managed is the American story, not just the Afro-American story, that research sh should uncover and teaching should pass on. The metaphor of racial divide produces illogical formulations that are as hard to uproot as dandelions, even in the face of contrary facts. For example, my students read the great Frederick Douglass's narrative with its vivid close-up of his owner's religious conversions, style of consumption, speech habits, and general character, but despite all that, retain the notion that slavery belongs to the past of Black Americans alone. Individual versus collective. Finding the right balance between the individual and the collective not only helps us to make sense of the past, it helps us to engage our students with that past in a way that will serve them better as citizens who have work to do in fashioning from the past a more civilized and humane present and future. Unfortunately, it is easy to get the balance wrong. Our very language of ten tempts us, or sorry, often <laughs> tempts us to do so. We talk, for example, about oral history as though interviews with witnesses and participants, valuable certainly as a way to get, in, get at individual experience, were a type of history when they are actually a type of evidence, no different in principle from any other type. Evidence, whether interviews, government documents, private papers, or archaeological remains, cannot speak for itself. It never adds up to history until it is scrutinized, evaluated, and ordered in light of other evidence. Similarly, talk of recovering voices from the past or letting voices speak is either a self-delusion or a confidence game. Reduced to their shared fallacy, these tricks of speech represent the elevation of individual experience to the point that it overshadows collective experience, which, after all, is the only kind that affords us a handhold on the machinery of our destiny as human beings. As deceptive as overemphasis on the individual is the elaboration of a collective picture so grand and encompassing that it blots out individual experience. The danger is not just that we may lose touch with individual experience, but that in the process, we may falsify the big picture itself. My sister likes to recall the essay at the end of a McNeil Lehrer report some years ago, in which Roger Rosenblatt referred to Eisenhower as the sleepy conservative president who launched the civil rights movement. With a turn of a phrase, the essayist performed a disappearing act on the lives of those Afro-American Southerners who risked life and livelihood and often lost both so that Eisenhower might be forced to play his bit part, and Lyndon Johnson his supporting role in the drama of the civil rights movement. It is not just the lives of the true soldiers of the movement that got falsified in the shuffle. It was the history of the nation in that crucial era. President Itis, the disease that leads otherwise sane people to argue that Eisenhower launched the civil rights movement, movement Lincoln freed the slaves, Roosevelt cured the depression, and Nixon ended the war in Vietnam. 
is a common example, but not the only one, of a big picture that proves false because its individual components have gotten lost. John Boston Set the racial divide metaphor alongside the following story about the Civil War and notice how uncomfortably the two fit together. John Boston is a humble individual who is nevertheless part of that very big story, and I propose to introduce him to you through a letter that he addressed to his wife in 1862. The very provenance of the document tells you how grand is the drama in which his individual life became suddenly engulfed. After all, how many letters from a husband to his wife end up in the National Archives in the records of the Adjutant General's Office, which is where this one landed? It landed there because John Boston, a slave in Maryland, escaped from his owner, and having found refuge with the soldiers of a Union regiment encamped in neighboring Virginia, wrote to inform his wife of his successful escape and to provide her with details of his whereabouts so that she could write to him. His wife may never have seen the letter, but Boston's owner certainly saw it, and so did a member of the Maryland legislature, to whom the owner complained, and so in turn did the governor of Maryland, to whom the legislator referred the matter, and so did General George McClellan, to whom the governor addressed an indignant demand to know just what Union soldiers thought they were doing, harboring the runaway slaves of loyal citizens of Maryland. The letter finally reached the Secretary of War, although I do not know whether he troubled himself to read it. Complaints from Maryland slaveholders about runaway property having become a dime a dozen in those days. So the person I am about to introduce to you was certainly involved in big doings, but what about him as an individual? Before I introduce him to you in his own words, perhaps I should let you imagine him as he might have been imagined, let us say, by the filmmakers who gave us the movie Glory, as ragged, dirty, unkept, illiterate, inarticulate, and naive as the enlisted men of the 54th Massachusetts Volunteer Regiment so memorably slandered in that movie. Ragged, dirty, unkept Boston may have been. As to the rest, let us meet him in his own words. My dear wife, it is with great joy I take this time to let you know where I am. I am now in safety in the 14th Regiment of Brooklyn this day. I can address you, thank God, as a free man. I had a little trouble in getting away, but as the Lord led the children of Israel to the land of Canaan, Canaan, so he led me to a land where freedom will reign in spite of earth and hell. Not knowing whether he and his wife would ever see each other again, Boston tried to offer comfort. I trust the time will come when we shall meet again, and if we don't meet on, on earth, we will meet in heaven, where Jesus reigns. Finally, he entreated his wife to write to him at once and told her how to do so. I want you to write to me as soon as you can without delay. Direct your letter to the 14th Regiment, New York State Militia, Uptons Hill, Virginia, in care of Mr. Cranford Comerie. As you listen to that language, picture the letter itself. It has no punctuation, the capitalization is erratic, and the spelling is phonetic. It is the work, clearly, of a person having little or no formal education. But uneducated does not mean inarticulate. Boston is no tongue-tied na naif, as in the movie Glory, awaiting the discipline of sympathetic white officers to teach him that he is a man. Nor does he communicate with his wife in black English, a concept, by the way, that fools people who would not, for a moment, fall for anything called white English, though people of European descent have their own distinctive ways of speaking English, just as do people of African descent. Boston's diction is that of the King James Bible, his eschatology conventionally Christian. If we don't met, meet on earth, we will meet in heaven where Jesus reigns. His understanding of marriage, family, and romantic love between husband and wife firmly mainstream. Separate lives live together. We might indeed call those of John Boston and the white people who owned him, owned his wife, and define the terrain on which he and his wife could seek to build a marriage and raise a family. And as if to drive the point home, Boston could not even tell his wife how to write to him without at the same time informing his owner. Indeed, a suspect, or indeed I suspect, though I cannot prove it, 
that Boston expected his owner to intercept the letter and intended to gloat, to dare his owner to try to get him back, when he gave his wife precise instructions about how to reply. Direct your letter to the 14th Regiment, New York State Militia, Uptons Hill, Virginia, in care of Mr. Cranford Comrie. Rebecca Garvin set up. Someone I never met, though she is closer to me than John Boston, may help to illustrate our point about the need to understand together the separate lives of those divided and those joined by the color line. What follows is a story about Rebecca Garvin, our great-grandmother, a story told by her daughter, our grandmother. It happened in Charleston, South Carolina, in an area reserved for white people. I will let my sister, Grandmother Fields's collaborator, tell you the story, and then I will ask you to notice something about it. Rebecca Garvin. When my son Rob was small, mother used to take him out every day to Colonial Lake, which was in the middle of downtown Charleston. She carried him in a special carriage I bought for him from Hartman's mail order house. Few in the city had anything like my carriage. It was ivory colored wicker work and it had a reversible top. As you walked, you could look at the baby. Mother got busy and crocheted an ivory blanket which she laced through with blue ribbon around the sides and then caught with blue vow or blue bows. Then she covered some pants guards, which men used in those days when riding their bicycles, to pull the ends of the blanket through so it would drape nicely. I don't think by the time she got through that anybody in town, black or white, had a fancier baby carriage. It entertained her to go along President Street and then up Cal Calhoun to the lake, talking and laughing with Rob. The only drawback was that if she got tired, she couldn't sit down. The benches by Colonial Lake were for white only. But anyway, mother went almost every day. One day, a big burly Irish policeman came up to her to admire this rich baby and play with it too. He smiled, but when he looked in and saw it was a black baby in the carriage, that was the end of the smiling. Where did you get that carriage? I didn't get it. His mother got it. Ask her. And she stood there looking him right in the face, just daring him to touch anything, daring him, and mad enough to spit. When he found out it was a black baby she had been pushing every day, he tried to forbid her to come down. She just kept looking at him right in his red face until he got through talking. Then she carried on walking around Colonial Lake, round and round and round, as much as she was able. Mother said the Lord gave her strength that day to keep on walking around that lake. The policeman couldn't do anything because many black women walked with white babies down there. It wasn't forbidden for a black woman to take any color baby to Colonial Lake. She just couldn't sit down. Rebecca Garvin Conclusion For most of you, that story is the conventional story of white racism as epitomized in the stereotypical relationship between Negro and Irish immigrant. But what I want you to notice is the figure who dominates its action, without appearing in person at all. The white Charleston aristocrat, the one to whom the Irish policeman was supposed to show deference. That figure's aura of superiority was so great that his or her symbolic presence in the form of a hidden baby was enough to suspend the etiquette of the color line, so far as the behavior of the policeman toward a black woman in a semi-forbidden place was concerned. Why did that policeman grin at Rebecca Garvin every day? Not to express his goodwill toward her or his delight to find her out walking on a fine day. He grinned because the fine carriage and fittings led him to assume that she was the servant of his own betters, tending the child of his betters. Correspondingly, his anger when he discovered his mistake grew from the realization that he had mistakenly offered courtesy to a black woman thinking he was offering it to her white employer. In the same way, Jim Crow and the railways offered an exemption for the Afro-American servant attending her mistress or the mistress's child. It is easy to overlook the fact that the apparatus of Jim Crow, like that of slavery, imposed relations of dominance and subordination among Euro-Americans, not just between Afro-Americans and Euro-Americans. In other words, among the separate lives divided by the color line, lives that we must analyze together if we are to make sense of them, are those of white people whose rank with respect to each other requires examination. 
One group of white people outranked the other precisely because it was in a position to oppress and exploit black people. A vast reservoir of bitterness and violence might overflow at any moment against the Afro-American whose words or actions or whose simple being reminded a white person of his subservience to another white person. Aubrey Welch set up. Although such encounters certainly offered periodic reminders of one white person's subservience to another, it is more accurate to say that segregation promoted intermittent amnesia on the matter. So when history writ large floodlights segre segregation, it brings out the black-white distinction while leaving white-white class distinctions hidden in shadow. The disappearance effect applies only at a distance, however. In the next story, Grandmother Fields delivers, in a slow-motion close-up, the class resentments of the white poor that might suddenly erupt in violence. The background to this story is the constant diplomacy by which Grandmother Fields sought to obtain improvements, of one kind and another, for her school on James Island. Her, her interlocutor is Mr. Welch, a prosperous landowner who served as the superintendent. On this occasion, her agenda is to obtain certain extra things for the Rosenwald Day program. Polished recitation, or polished, sorry, polished, <laughs> polished recitations and artful props may say a forbidden thing, that black children are the equals of their white age mates, silently without a dangerous word. Danger looms, however, the moment Grandmother Fields discloses to Mr. Welch her intention to invite all the white neighbors to Rosenwald Day. Listen to her. Aubrey Welch. Aubrey Welch hurried up to tell me, wait a minute, hold on. I must invite the white people and leave the crackers alone because the cracker don't want you to have even a painted bench. And if the cracker had reason to think that the school was getting too good for the Negra, why he might burn it down. Now the white people thought different and would he pee too? Uh-huh. Well, Mr. Welch, who are the white people I should invite? As soon as he let me know who and who and who were the white people, I made it my business to invite them all. Always fast on her feet, Grandmother Fields managed to seize the unexpected arrow in midair and turn it to practical use getting a globe for the classroom, a bus for a school trip, all sorts of extra things. The white people did give help to the school over the years, she recalls, and no crackers ever did come to burn down what was too grand for the Negras. But that night, when I got home with what Mr. Welch said, Bob and I laughed until we cried. Can you imagine what made them giddy with laughter? I howled as she told the story and did not ask myself why until years later. I suspect that they were savoring the ruin of an illusion, a white supremacy under which all white people were created equal. In their generation, as in ours, black children were taught early on, for safety's sake, that you'd best watch yourself around poor white people, frightening because they were resentful, elongated in Charlestonian speech as resentful. Until that day, it had not occurred to grandmother and grandfather fields that higher class white people saw, saw poor white people in pretty much the same way. Mrs. Samuel Burden set up. That is why I prefer in my teaching to speak of Jim Crow rather than segregation. Segregation is too small a concept to encompass the reality lived by those caught up in Jim Crow. With the end of slavery in which owners exploited laborers by owning their persons, Employers commanded labor by controlling access to the means of labor, subsistence, and livelihood. The power of controlling such access takes many forms, and those seeking access understand full well the protean quality of the force that blocks them, as well as the complicated rituals through which they must dramatize their own subjection. Education could be a militant act in and of itself, on the part of both teacher and student. And so it was in the case of Mrs. Samuel Burden, an elderly woman, grandmother, Fields encountered while teaching on James Island during the 1920s. Mrs. Samuel Burden. 
Mrs. Burden was a military widow, collecting a pension, which meant that she had to collect her money from the white powers that be in downtown Charleston. So when my grandmother opened special classes for the parents and grandparents of her day pupils, Mrs. Burden made it her business to be there. People asked Mrs. Burden why she bothered and asked Grandmother Fields why she bothered with a pupil so old. Old as she was, she was going to learn to sign her name. So Mrs. Burden kept coming to school and Grandmother Fields said, brought her teacher more eggs than the law allows. Let me open a parenthesis. It is often said that both during slavery and after, Afro-Americans had a faith in education that verged on the religious. Seek ye first the kingdom of the book, and all else shall be added unto you. It is less often said that both during slavery and after, the comparably fervent conviction of some white Americans pushed in the opposite direction. They became as unconvinced of Afro-Americans' intellectual capacity to benefit from schooling as they were already convinced of Afro-Americans' superior aptitude for planting, tending, and harvesting crops. In 1908, the year Grandmother Fields was finishing her training to teach, a South Carolina school official wrote that educa education carries a black person to the penitentiary faster than anything. So Grandmother Fields was crossing and recrossing a battlefield, well known to black and white James Islanders, as she walked from farm to farm, urging black families to send their children to school, and perhaps even more when she created literacy classes for adults. Let me now close the parenthesis and come back to the scene of Mrs. Burden's enthusiasm over 70 years ago. Mrs. Burden was determined to be able to walk into the office of downtown white folks one day and sign for her pension properly. She was determined to stop having to put herself down as X. Grandmother Fields said, the day Mrs. Burden could go into that office and sign Mrs. Samuel Burden, she almost didn't need her walking stick. In the Jim Crow South, black and white Americans knew that schooling really was about where one stood in the polity. Mrs. Burden knew it. So did the people who saw her coming that fine day. After long preparation, she, ex she executed, or executed her mission as a private in the long guerrilla war in America that preceded the conventional phase that finally pressed a sleepy conservative like Dwight D. Eisenhower to a strange sort of generalship. Segregation integration does not encompass what Mrs. Burden's struggle, as opposed to Eisenhower's, was about. Who in the world ever sat down in hot, a hot church in the evening, or at a segregated lunch counter at noonday, or faced dogs and water hoses and cattle prods singing, Oh, integration. But surely some of you remember the real civil rights song, Oh, freedom. Downtown white people set up. What is more, segregation integration conjures up a stick figure diagram of life under Jim Crow, rather than life as people actually lived it. From a distance, it looks like a predictable world organized by general rules, explicit scripts, identifying costumes, that is, physical appearance, and infrequently written signs with local knowledge doing the rest. The view from close up only now and then fit, only now and then fit the diagram. For Mrs. Burden's battlefield planning and preparation, downtown served as her fixed objective. For that was the symbolic locus of power in Charleston, and it generally generally looked the part. In reality, and in accord with the nature of power, the battlefield moved to meet people wherever they were, whatever they might be doing. In the midst of life, we are in death intones the officiant at funeral ceremonies according to the tradition in which we were reared. While Jim Crow was not death, at least not always, it did loom up suddenly, like death in the midst of everyday activities, with unexpected features revealing themselves in different guises from moment to moment. Such was the case on a morning during the 1920s. In her bedroom slippers and with a coat thrown hastily over her nightgown, Grandmother Fields had driven Grandmother Field or Grandfather Fields to work in their recently acquired Model T and was on her way home. Since not too many black women drove cars, she recalled, 
you were recognized and you had to stop and greet people. To drive right by when you recognized someone and the someone recognized you was not done. That morning, Grandmother Fields saw Mr. Crawford pushing his vegetable cart. Downtown white people. Anyway, she slowed her progress and although Mr. Crawford saw her and stopped, a car coming alongside him did not. So, bam, a wreck, and out of this wreck comes a white man. Good Lord, now out of the other wreck comes a black woman in her house shoes. And I was a sight, trying to hold up my gown with my hands through the coat pockets and standing there in my worn-out slippers. In fact, my car wasn't really a wreck. I only had a small dent, but the other one looked bad. As my witness, Mr. Crawford sent a boy for a cop and waited with me all of us more or less on display out in the middle of the avenue. Ms. Fields, now don't you worry, Mr. Crawford said, but to tell you the truth, neither one of us knew what mightn't happen. The only thing I knew about the other driver was that he came from Vermont, which I read off his plates. He didn't talk to me and I didn't talk to him. When the cop got there, he walked around the two Model Ts, not saying much either at first. But then, all of a sudden, praise the Lord, the cop began to shout and carry on. You damn Yankees, so-and-so. You damn Yankees, such-and-such. Such. From the time I heard that, I kept, on say I kept on not saying a word. I kept quiet, sure enough. I was not the damn Yankee. What came next blurred the lines of the segregation integration diagram. Well, sir, the rebels took the whole thing in charge. Instead of all the white men getting together to say that I was not in the right, which I was, the white Charlestonians took sides with the black Charlestonian against the damn Yankee. First, we must go to the court. Now, just imagine. There I was, going up past the brasswork and the woodwork, marble everywhere, in my house slippers, a half-dressed colored woman going in the courthouse and a group of white men. I can't imagine what an onlooker mightn't have thought. Finally, we must go to a certain lawyer on Broad Street, near the Battery, where the, where the aristocratic lawyers stayed. They sure enough fixed the thing. That poor fellow had to pay everybody a hundred dollars. William Faulkner set up. The landscape of Jim Crow can also be envisioned as a minefield. A person may traverse it safely by not stepping on the mines, but can discover where mines are buried only by stepping on one. Like all analogies, this one is imperfect. Its weakness is that the buried hazards of Jim Crow, unlike those in a minefield, are not in set positions, waiting to go off when stepped on. Instead, the actions of those involved in any given encounter determine the placement of the mine, as well as when or whether it goes off. The, particip the participants produce the outcome as the encounter unfolds. William Faulkner offered a brilliant example of the pertinent dynamics in the encounter between three auto thieves and a mud farmer in his novel, The Reavers. In the process, he illustrated the role of laughter and the complex etiquette of racist subordination. Ned McCaslin, an Afro-American employee and wrong side of the blanket relation of the priest family has gone on an illicit excursion to Memphis in a car borrowed without permission from Grandfather Priest, in company with Priest's 11-year-old grandson and a white employee of the family. En route to Memphis, the car gets stuck in a mud puddle, deliberately cultivated by a white farmer who makes his living by offering passing motorists the loan of his mules to extract their cars. As the farmer, in the course of hard bargaining with the white employee over the fee to be paid for the service, offers to pull the car from a second puddle free of charge, Ned gets involved in a conversation with him. There's another hole just this side of the bridge that I'm throwing in free, he said to Ned, what we call the reserve patch up this away. You mean the Christmas middle? Ned said. Maybe I do, the man said. What is it? Ned told him. It's how we done at McCaslin back before the surrender when old LQC was alive and how the Edmonds boy still does. Every spring a middle is streaked off in the best ground on the place and every stalk of cotton betwixt that middle and the edge of the field belongs to the Christmas fund. Not for the boss, but for every McCaslin black person to have a Christmas share of it. That's what a Christmas middle is. 
Likely you mud farming folks up here never heard of it. The man looked at Ned a while. After a while, Ned said, he, he, he. That's better, the man said. I thought for a minute me and you was about to misunderstand one another. In Faulkner's telling, the incident is humorous, but he does not miss or permit his readers to miss the undercurrent of menace and violence lurking in, this, in the transaction. This incident ends with a giggle, but it might easily have ended with fire and a rope. Tony Morrison Faulkner's incident ended with neither fire nor rope, but with laughter. Laughter not as mirth, but as means, a social artifact mutually available to Ned and the mud farmer. Another novelist, Toni Morrison, has provided us with an illustration from our own time of laughter as a means of negotiating separate lives lived together. This time, however, we see the laughter from the perspective of the one who enjoys it, rather than the one who deploys it, the mud farmer, as it were, rather than Ned. Toni Morrison has drawn attention to the points Senator John Danforth chose to emphasize when he introduced Clarence Thomas, Thomas as a nominee for the Supreme Court. He is his own person. That is my first point. Second, he laughs. To some, this may seem a trivial matter. To me, it's important because laughter is an antidote to that dread disease, federal, federalitis. The obvious strategy of interest groups trying to defeat a Supreme Court nominee is to suggest that there is something weird about the individual. I suggest that there is something weird about Clarence Thomas. It's his laugh. It's the loudest laugh I have ever heard. It comes from deep inside and it shakes his body. And here is something at least as weird in this most uptight of cities. The object of his laughter is often himself. Every black person who heard those words understood, Morrison affirms. Ned would have agreed with her. She continues, how necessary, how reassuring were both the grin and its being summoned for display. It is the laughter, the chuckle that invites and precedes any discussion or association with a black person. For whites who require it, it is the gesture of accommodation and obedience needed to open discussion with a black person and certainly to continue it. The ethnic joke is one formulation. The obligatory recognition of race and possible equanimity is in the face of it, or in the face of it. But in the more polite halls of the Senate, the laugh will do. It is difficult to imagine a sponsor introducing Robert Bork or William Gates, or that happy exception, Thurgood Marshall, with a call to this most clearly understood metonym for racial accommodation. Conclusion. Perhaps the juxtaposition of these two very different novelists, William Faulkner and to Toni Morrison, is an appropriate way to close. Both have drawn out the collective meaning of an individual act, laughter, but laughter not as terms of endearment, but as rules of engagement. Both unforgettably portray the dimly understood protocols that have served to join separate and unequal, yet joint and simultaneous existences. Beyond that, there they stand two people who epitomize separate lives lived together, two people who had their paths crossed probably could not have conversed as peers, and yet they analyze their separate yet together worlds in uncannily kindred ways. From their different points of view evolves an honest vision of America's collective past. It should be our ethical aim as teachers to equip ourselves and our students to gaze upon that past with the breadth and honesty that the task requires. Thank you.